can go joints, proximal to distal, as we work through this upper extremity. Uh, the, 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 the main interesting piece that we're going to have is that when we talk about hip motion, it's very much isolated at the hip. I don't have to get up into the uh, side joint for the sake of understanding how the femur moves in relation to the pelvis. When we look at the glenohumeral joint, the, all the motions, not supposed to the glenohumeral, but well, yeah, the motions that the shoulder can do, the motions that we can create with our humerus and distal to that, um, those motions actually require us to consider the AC and the SC, the acromioclavicular and the sternoclavicular joints. So it's, it's a bit more involved because to get motion in the shoulder, we have to move the humerus on the glenoid, which is going to create rotation of the scapula, which can only happen with a, a certain degree of mobility at the AC and SC joints. So there's a lot of little conversations that we have to have to blend all of this together. This is one of the more, I think, challenging conceptual things, just at least on the entry level, uh, to, to kind of grasp within this. So let's do this, the basics first and talk about this joint structure. So again, we've got a clavicle with a convexity that goes in the proximal two-thirds, then we go to a concavity in the distal third. Your primary fracture site is going to be that middle third sitting right in there. Um, we have four main ligaments that are going to stabilize the sacromioclavicular joint. I love this thing. So, um, unfortunately, only one of them, two of them are shown in general. So we have to kind of mentally imagine. Um, the joint capsule here, you've got a saddle joint of the fat end of that clavicle on the proximal side that's it got its own concavity. And so it's actually goes up to where it can, it can kind of sit like a saddle over that manubrium, that articular surface of the manubrium. Inside there is an articular disc that helps cushion and absorb and, and create some padding. Um, so saddle joint, articular <coughs> disc, and then we have anterior and posterior sternoclavicular ligaments. So those are the first two. And they're really just reinforcements of the joint capsule. They're not unique in terms of uh, being extracapsular or um, separate structures. They're just thickenings and embedding, a, a reinforcement of those structures. You can get some fun, happy dislocations here. You can get fractures here. Uh, dislocations typically will go either superior or anterior. It is conceivable, and they do happen on times, to where that direct force drives the clavicle posteriorly. You can imagine that if I go in and add in a couple extra structures, say your GI tract with your uh, and then throw in your trachea on top of that. Throw in. There we go. Your esophagus on top of that. And then all of a sudden we've got, um, you drive that posteriorly and it's going to push into those prickly cartilages. It's going to push into uh, your airway. You're going to feel like you're choking because there's going to be something obstructing. Um, if I take a moment and overlay your nervous and your cardiac system, cardiovascular structures, you can see how driving that clavicle posteriorly would probably constitute a medical emergency. There's a whole lot of chance that we're going to damage a whole lot of stuff. So we got to be very careful with that. If you do suspect it, see it, that we get it addressed. Um, now, it's also, this, this injury happens to people under the age of 25 more often. Um, part of the reason because those individuals are involved with sports, a little bit more reckless with their life choices, fun, happy stuff like that. Uh, so they get higher risk of impacts that are going to help drive this thing. Um, but if we go a few years earlier and start looking at, say, 16 to 18, right as this growth plate that sits on this proximal end of the clavicle starts, or before it starts clothing, closing, then that same force may actually cause a fracture here at the growth plate rather than a dislocation of the joints. The joint may hold, but it's a fractured clavicle you're dealing with. Is that really going to change a whole lot about what we're doing and how we treat this person? Yeah, probably not. We're still going to want to sling and swathe, stabilize to the best of our ability, manage vitals where it's necessary, and get them into the ER so they can resolve it for us. Okay? So our job is largely to recognize the acuteness of it and the need for a referral and get them there. 
So, so anterior, posterior, sternoclavicular ligaments. Now, next piece we have is something called the interclavicular. So it runs from proximal clavicle to proximal clavicle over the manubrium, helping to stabilize the clavicles from the pressure. So anterior posterior sternoclavicular and then the interclavicular going in between the clavicles. And the last one is the first of our two tethers. The tether is something that holds it down and in place. We have a costoclavicular ligament that goes from the first rib up to the clavicle, helping to hold it down. So the clavicle is kind of unique in that we have two joints, and there's one muscle that attaches to that bone that assists moving it at all. So for all of the motions that it does, elevation, depression, rolling forward, uh, protraction, retraction, all of that's created by distal movements. So the only muscle that we really have that, that stabilizes this is the subclavius. Stabilizes the wrong term, but moves it actively is the subclavius. So we're going to take pec major. So, sitting up underneath here, and you'll see the, the, the origin of the insertion points. It's the subclavius muscle, where that blue is, well up underneath, is, it just runs from that first rib up under to the bottom of the clavicle, helping to pull it back down. Okay. So, um, moving distal to that, we then get to where that clavicle begins to flatten itself out, we have the distal end of the, towards the acromion, and in that end, it gets very flat. And that flat end articulates kind of a side-by-side -side gliding joint with the acromion. So what, what's the, what bone is the acromion on? So the acromion is, is a landmark on the scapula, okay? So, You've got the spine of the scapula, which extends up, flattens out into the acromion process. And that acromion process then butts up with the clavicle and a gliding joint. And again, just like the SC, there's an articular disc in between those. Now, the principal ligaments we have. Principal ligaments we have. Okay. Uh, there is a joint capsule that goes around it. One gliding joint is a type of synovial joint. This synovial joint has a joint capsule around it. You have a superior and inferior acromioclavicular ligament, so a reinforcement of that joint capsule above and below. If I come back and I take a cord, is there any confusion here? If you hold one end, I hold the other. I don't care how hard I pull against you, we still don't have the leverage to resist an up and down motion. Right? Okay. 
So from that, you understand that that clavicle, when it elevates, when it depresses, the acromioclavicular ligaments, superior and inferior, really don't have the leverage to do us any good there. So those don't make up the principal stability holding that clavicle in place. So whereas you have that acromioclavicular ligament, which in large part is the joint capsule, it is the joint capsule with reinforcements above and below. Um, if you get a peak of it from underneath, you'll see that we have a couple ligaments going directly up under the clavicle from that coracoid process. So that's giving me a distal tether holding it down. So if I have the injury of a separated shoulder, an AC sprain, then it's damaging, yes, the acromioclavicular joint, so the ligament itself. Is, but it's actually more specifically getting into this coracoclavicular ligament that goes underneath. So if I damage that, if I stretch that, then it, it limits my ability to hold that clavicle down. It's going to want to elevate. So take that into consideration when you have somebody who comes in for an eval with a separated shoulder. Grade one, no real visible damage. Grade two, we've stretched it enough that there's joint play. So you get a really kind of cool, fun feature. It's called a piano key sign. So you can come up and you can push on the end of that clavicle like a piano key. And what happens when you push a piano key down? It pops back up. So you can play the clavicle like a piano. You can push it down, let go, it'll pop back up. Now, that largely means that this is damaged and this is damaged. You get to a grade three and this is ruptured and this is mostly ruptured. Grossly unhappy. So there's taping ways, uh, with blue fin tape, other tapes, that you can apply a downward pull to help hold that clavicle down. It reduces a lot of that tension, a lot of that pain. Now, a unique piece between both of these joints is that for all the weight of the humerus and the scapula and all the muscles that, are, that support them, the only principal bony osseous connection to the axial skeleton that we have is through these two joints. So with an SC injury, a, clavic a clavicular injury, clavicle injury, or an AC injury, we've damaged the, the, the support to hold that limb up. So they're going to present to you carrying the weight in their opposite arm because it hurts to let it hang. It feels better to hold it here. These individuals, you're going to want to put them in a sling to where it's holding the weight of the arm across the neck rather than through that clavicle. Now, clavicle fracture, again, how is that person going to present differently than just an AC or an ST sprain? So we're going to lean our ear towards it, but look away. Why? Why is that frequently their body positioning when they come to you with a clavicle fracture? Pressure. Less pressure. What's the pressure coming from? What creates the pressure on the clavicle? Why is it that way? Just with the clavicle fracture, not so much with an AC or an SC joint sprain. Huh? Which one? Which one? There's one of them in particular. There's subclavius, but he's not going to do a whole lot for us. Sterno. 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 Clido master. Yes. Sterno clido master. Sterno clido master. SCM. We're in there, right? So SCM is coming from mastoid process down and in on the clavicle in the first rib. So if I'm using it, it's pulling on my clavicle because that's its action point. So we're going to shorten it take the pressure off of it, and then cradle that arm, and that's a pretty good indication that you've got a clavicle fracture. Good so far? All right, now, um, corcoclavicular ligament, you'll notice there's these two bands. So there's two separate parts. So from it, we have a trapezoid and a conoid part. So 
trapezoid, more anterior, conoid, more posterior. I don't have a lot of differentiation about what they do in terms of needing you to identify, but recognize that there are in fact two different bands that matter. When we get into different grading of injuries, grade obviously grade one, two, and three of a separated shoulder we just talked about, so a slight sprain, stretch on a grade two, grade three we're getting into full tears. There's grades four, five, six, into seven, I think, to where we've got fractures that are showing up at different locations in and around these ligaments that would further destabilize it. Clearly not something that we would necessarily directly involve ourselves with the differences of, but we need to understand what the repairs look like when they've gone through the orthopedic before we start working on them. Because those will need to get um, put back in place by an ortho. All right. So next ligament, continuing off of the coracoid process since we made it that far, this is the coracoacromial ligament. So what's unique about that ligament? It's got a little hole in it. There's an artery that feeds in through there. I wouldn't worry too much about that. But what else is unique about it? It's running from the same bone. Yeah. It's going from the same bone to the same bone. So the coracoid process and the acromion process are both off of the scapula. So we're pretty much splinting an area in between two landmarks. Now we had that same kind of feature a little bit with the pelvis. When we started having the inguinal ligament, when we had the sacro tuberous ligament. So we had arcs, and we were kind of spanning those arcs to help hold the pressure. So we had three bones that were fused together with some major, the greater sciatic notch that we had a ligament that were running across them. Sacro spinous, sacro tuberous, the, the inguinal ligament, all of those were kind of helping stabilize some of these arcways. Now, up here though, there isn't that same kind of pressure in the system. So this acromic clavicular ligament is doing something else. It's completing the roof over the glenoid, over the humerus, the humeral head. <clears throat> so let's finish with the ligaments of the glenohumeral joint. We'll go back into the motion of the joint to help understand why that's important. So, a chromio, so the corcoacromial ligament is completing that roof over that, that humeral head. All right, that gives us four ligaments left to really concern ourselves with <coughs> at the moment with the glenohumeral joint. So the glenoid is the articular surface of the scapula, and it's very thin, very shallow, kind of like a dinner plate, but it's small. Small especially compared to the size of the humeral head that sits on top of it. <clears throat> Principal ligaments we have, off again, off that coracoid process, the coracohumeral ligament is going to band over the supralateral portion, which is going to limit our external rotation and limit our horizontal abduction. The next three Superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. Superior, middle, inferior glenohumeral. And again, those are as well more of just reinforcements, thickenings within the joint capsule. So joint function. rolling, sliding, spinning, okay? You can take the humeral head on the glenoid, and I can roll it, I can slide it, and I can spin it. 
Now, any given synovial joint is going to do the same basic things. I mean, any two articular surfaces that rotate about an axis are going to have the same needs and demands, well, the same needs and abilities to, to do each of those motions at different levels. The unique architecture of the joint is going to help drive that. But the rolling and the sliding inevitably will be done by pretty much any given synovial joint because they're all arc-based. They're all rotating about an axis. What's different between roll and slide? One you roll, one you don't. How can you put it in a little bit more technical terms than that? Okay, so rolling, I'm changing points. Roll sliding, I'm changing points. Lots of speed there as I accelerate my butt towards the ground. So what is it? You're, you're in there. <laughs> I thought a friend. What is it? What's different between them? Rolling versus sliding. What's what's different between them? How can you articulate it? Everything's used. Say that better. How is everything used? What do you mean everything is used? Okay. It's, 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 we're in there somewhere. So if you, as I roll, a new point on the bottle touches a new point on the table. That's where you were kind of going with that. It's like all the surface is being used. Like I'm using a new point on the bottle versus a new point on the table. When I slide, I have the same point on the bottle touching a new point on the ground. When I spin, there's the same point in contact between both of those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for the prop. Thank you. All right. So we're going to look at two terms that I want you to, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce them to you. Uh, I'm going to introduce them to you now. When you get into rehab, you're going to play with them a whole lot more. Because so we're going to get into a, something, a process called, or a treatment called joint mobilization. So to understand how to work with joint mobilization. And to understand, back at this level, what these ligaments do we have to understand a little bit more about how joints move, okay? Um, so we're gonna have a term called osteokinematics and arthrokinematics. So the movement of the bone versus the movement of the joint, all right? Now, if I take the ball of the head of the humerus and I abduct, that is actively trying to roll upwards. The problem we get to is that we have a small little glenoid, big, big humeral head. If I roll, I'm going up and over the top of it. So protection number one we have is this roof that we put in. So there's a, there's a limit, something physically blocking that motion which creates some issues. That means it would restrict my ability to move up because it's gonna get blocked and prevent that motion. You don't even feel it, do you? So the next piece though, as we roll up, it gets blocked and to prevent it from rolling over the top, it has to slide down. So both things are happening at the same time. As I roll my arm up, as my osteo, goes up, the joint itself is sliding down to maintain that, that, that adequate positioning. And you'll find that's not always the case. There's, there's, one is a 
convex surface on a concave. So a convex humeral head on a concave glenoid. And in those times, my osteo will be opposite of my arthro. And this is, again, to a point that you're going to play with this more in rehab. So it's more of that introduction. But to understand what these ligaments do, you can understand why. If I horizontally abduct, if I go this way, my arm is going back. Where's my humeral head going? Where's the joint itself going? It's going anterior. Because it's trying to roll backwards, but it has to slide forward. So if I need to go in and have somebody who has restrictions in their joint, in their humerus, in the glenohumeral joint, and they can't abduct well, typically we need to look and consider the inferior glenohumeral ligament as being a culprit. Because it would be preventing the downward slide to let my arm get up. Kind of sort of makes sense? If you can understand the shoulder, then you can pretty much compare any other joint to the shoulder and figure it out. Because if it's the same basic surface, a humeral head that's rounded on a concave glenoid, a concave, a dented in surface, if it's like that, then it's going to have the same opposite to where the osteo goes the opposite direction from the arthro. If it's the other way, to where it's a concave moving on top of a convex, then it's going to flip this to where osteo and arthro go in the same direction, which means that I have to work on ligaments in the same side as the direction I'm moving. So again, rehab stuff, but it definitely impacts your understanding, perhaps in an easier way, how these ligaments are restricting posterior motion. So the ligaments in the front are preventing us from going too far back. Okay? Okay, so what have we done so far? We have a sternoclavicular ligament. Sternoclavicular has anterior posterior sternum. Um, anterior posterior sternoclavicular ligaments for that joint. We have the interclavicular ligament that stabilizes compression, and then we have the costoclavicular ligament that gives us some stability um, against too much elevation of that clavicle. Underneath, we have the subclavius muscle, which I can show you now. It's not much faster. I got right there. He lives up underneath, it goes from the first rib up into the clavicle in the groove of the subclavius. Helping to pull it back down. Then distally, the chromoclavicular joint and that joint is stabilized by the chromoclavicular ligament. Uh, which is more or less the joint capsule, but more specifically underneath it's got a tether of that corpoclavicular ligament, the trapezoid and the conoid part. Then we have the corpoacromial ligament running across, which closes off that roof. see it creates kind of an arcway right over the top of the humeral head, limiting it from abduction, from going and rolling up over the top. And then anteriorly, we have the corcohumeral ligament, and then over the joint specifically, in which is the joint capsule, we have the superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. Cool. That's the vast majority of what we need for ligament structures. Now let's talk about how this thing moves. Because again, when we talk about humeral shoulder motion, we have to include a conversation that gets into understanding uh, the 
all three joints as they work together. And we need to add in kind of a fourth articulation as well. So we have this, what we call the scapulothoracic articulation. So the interaction of this scapula sitting on top of the ribs is not static. It's very, very dynamic. It protracts, it retracts, it goes, it slides anteriorly around the cage, it pulls back in towards the scapula, and so towards the, the spine of the scapula. Oh, goodness gracious, the spine. Uh, it's going to elevate and depress, it can tip forward, like when you roll it, your shoulder forward, it's tipping anteriorly. So there's a lot going on here, but this is created by... Well, initially, it's created a lot by the humeral motion pushing on that glenoid, pushing up into that corcochromial arch, that corcochromial ligament. So as I move my shoulder, it reaches up and pushes on that glenoid. When it pushes on that glenoid, it creates a rotation. So if I want this to go up, if I keep pushing it, it's going to keep rotating it. And that is in turn going to put pressure on my AC and my FC joints. So let's break that down for a second. So here's my person. That's his arm. We're going to call motion up to 90 degrees phase one. We're going to call motion from 90 degrees up to 180 degrees phase two. So you remember the, the breathing chart that was like this plus this is the full vital capacity. So we're going to look at this in a few different ways. So we'll make sure the numbers always add back up so we're not losing each other. Okay? All right. I have 180 degrees possible in abduction, or I should be able to. The glenohumeral joint all by itself has 120 degrees. So just looking at the interaction of the humerus on the glenoid, I have 120 degrees. Total. The rest of that motion, if it's only going up to 120, is provided by the scapula rotating. So this glenoid humeral, I can get 120 out of. The rest of that 60, 120 plus 60 equals 180. The rest of that 60 comes from this rotating 60 degrees. So how is that happening? Phase one. From here to 90 degrees, abduction, 0 to 90. I've got plenty humeral going 60 degrees. I have scapular rotation going the other 30. And that 30 is broken down into sternoclavicular, about 25, acromioclavicular, about 5. So as that scapula torques initially starts rotating, it's the SC joint here that gives me the leverage, the elevation of the clavicle to allow the scapula to rotate.
So for every two degrees that I have of lemmy-humeral motion, I have one degree of scapular rotation. So if I go up two degrees, that means my scapula has rotated one. For every abduction of two degrees I do in the lemmy-humeral joint, my scapula will rotate one. So I elevate 60, then my scap will rotate 30. The majority of that elevation allowed for the clavicle by the sternoclavicular joint in phase one. All right, phase two. Do we want to guess how much motion my glenohumeral humeral is going to give me? 60. Because I have a total of 120 and I've already gotten 60, I get the other 60 in phase two. How much scapular rotation should I have then? 30. Because I have 60 available total and I've already used 30 of it. So there's the other part. So nothing major difference at this point. The big difference is where the scapular rotation comes from. Because the sternoclavicular joint is about maxed out. It only gives me maybe five more degrees, maybe. That really depends on the sources you're looking at. The acromioclavicular gives me the rest. Somebody gets an AC sprain. When do they hurt? Yeah, from 90 degrees and above, it kills them because that's putting a huge amount of stress into the AC joint. Zero to 90, uh, it's not comfortable, but they can do okay. But as soon as you get to about 80, 85, and then 90, they're not liking you very much to ask them to do that. Okay? So this is your scapular thoracic rhythm. This is, this is in large part, well that's not the real, this is, this is shoulder motion that creates at least abduction. 180 degrees, split 120 to 60, 2 to 1 ratio. Phase 1, you're getting far more sternoclavicular motion. Phase 2, you're getting far more acromioclavicular motion. Third bud. Okay. Deal with this tonight. Please. So when you come back in next class period, this doesn't feel quite so poor. two separate bands that kind of cradle underneath the humeral head. Where that humerus kind of looks to sink by gravity, it kind of holds on to it, kind of like a hammock that just lets it settle against it. Now a unique piece about the joint structure of the humerus, of the glenohumeral joint, is what we have inside. So this ring, much like we had with the acetabulum, is a labral ring. So it's a cartilaginous ring of sorts that deepens the socket that we stick the humeral head in. But it's pliable. So we can reach up and it, it limits its motion, but without being rigid. When we did our palpations on the neck of the scapula, we came up from underneath on the lateral border, right up into this location up in here, which was the infraglenoid tubercle. What muscle originated there? So we were coming up from underneath to get up into here. What muscle was that underneath there? Triceps brachii long head. So the, the lateral and the medial head are on the humerus itself. The long head's the only one that crosses over. 
So good. Tricep brachii comes off the infraglenoid tubercle. There's also a supraglenoid tubercle, which sits right here at the top of the glenoid. And you'll see how there appears to be something projecting off of that. So when we get into the shoulder momentarily, when we get into musculature that drives and moves the shoulder, this is the long head of the biceps brachii. It actually inserts into the labrum, which goes into the supraglenoid tubercle. Where else have we seen something like that? Because we see it again when we grab a hold of that, that inferior glenohumeral ligament. It's doing the same thing as it dug, dives in, it's grabbing onto that labrum at about the four, five o'clock position, four o'clock position. So we have ligaments that grab in the labrum. We have a muscle tendon that's grabbing in the labrum. What was the unhappy triad? How does that happen? What's the mechanism by which that happens? So deceleration, I plant. I internally rotate in the adduct, so my knee drops in with rotation as I'm slowing down, putting a tremendous amount of force into it. ACL is probably going first. That rotation is going to take my ACL. So if I take that ACL out, it's going to increase that valgus stress. That valgus stress is resisted by what? MCL. MCL. So we're going to do the MCL. How does the meniscus get involved? It's like, my buddies, no! Yeah? yeah? It's easy enough. How does the MCL get involved? The rotation? But the pull part, though, the inner fibers of the MCL actually insert into the, the meniscus. So if I yank that meniscus, if I yank that MCL hard enough, it's just ripping its distal attachment point off, which is in the meniscus. So it's called a bucket handle, and it can create a bucket handle. I mean, it's lifting up that edge by that attachment point. Things that we can see here and here with other injuries. So bank cart lesions and slap tears, slap lesions. We can see from some of the same kind of mechanics. When we're taking what we've attached into that bone position, and we've ripped it off, and the ligament itself holds. But its proximal attachment gets ripped off. Something we concern ourselves with a bit. Um, So we have a motion here that in large part is going to push up into that corcochromial arch, that corcochromial ligament and the acromial process of the corcochromial arch. That fun little arcuate right there. So we lift up, it pushes on that glenoid, pushes on that acromial process, and that's going to create some, some upward elevation, some upward rotation of the scapula that way. The bone is clearly not just hanging out in space. So it's got a lot of dynamic attachments that help stabilize it. So there are six muscles that are scapula stabilizers. So it's time to add those in. So the muscles that we need to cover, we're looking at the muscles that act on the scapula, not acting from the scapula. So we're looking at things that are anchored on the ribs, on the spine, to pull the scapula one way or the other. Not so much the ones that are starting from the scapula to act on the humerus. All right? So from that, 
I'm going to grab a couple of them. So those are deltoids. <laughs> That's your infraspinatus. There's teres major, which we palpated. Oops. There's teres major. There's myoteres major. We're going to hide all those away. Cystus dorsi. Big guy. Hide him out of the way. And leave us with a clear picture of what we're dealing with. Scapular stabilized. What do you see first? The trapezius will give me the most superficial. So, trapezius muscle is going to be the most superficial. What's the origin of the trapezius muscle? Um, Occiput. T12. T12. Okay. So occiput, superior nuchal line, going down to T12. Now the insertion point as it comes up is all across the spine of the scap into the acromion process. So it flows all the way in through here in this very triangular kind of activity, triangular kind of motion. Now the traps, for as easy as they are because we've now studied where they are multiple times, they, they get a little bit more unique when you look at a, where, where they run, but the fiber orientation. So there's very much a superior, a middle, and an inferior fiber typing. That changes the line of pull, that changes the action. So again, this scapula can elevate, it can depress, it can rotate, it can protract coming forward around, the anterior around that rib cage, and it can retract coming back towards the spine. Quite a bit that it can do. And these traps create a lot of that motion. So the first of the six muscles is really kind of dynamic. The middle fibers are going to grab it and pull it back in towards the middle. They also have the capacity to somewhat downward rotate to where if they pull and it's elevated, it can help rock it back downward. My superior fibers are going to give me elevation, but they're also going to grab on to the spine and the acromion and pull it upwards, pivot it upwards to rotate it superior. So it's going to give me elevation as I go up. The inferior fibers are going to have some of that same line as they pull on this end. It's going to assist some of that elevation, that rotation. And then it also is clearly going to give me depression to where it pulls it back down. So trapezius does a lot based upon which fibers are firing. It does elevation and depression. It does upward rotation. It does retraction from the middle fibers in towards the spine. <laughs> And as those pull in as well, the middle fibers can help downward rotate it as well. So that is by far and away the most complex of the scapular stabilizers. We'll get it done with first. They just got a lot going on. So we'll take the trauma away. That's super, we'll hide them out of the way. Alright, so from that point we're left with quite a bit of stuff we can see. So this is levator scapula. Levator scap comes off the transverse process of C1 through 4, cervical 1 through 4, and it drops down into the superior angle of the scapula, and it's straight elevation. It's going to pull up on it to elevate for a shoulder shrug. Next pair, so that's number two, numbers three and four. We have rhomboid minor, rhomboid major. So rhomboid minor, rhomboid major, grabbing on that medial border. 
and they're going to retract in towards the spine. They also have the capacity to pull that medial border to where it helps pivot as well back down to where it rotates it downward. So as you do this, I think an easy way to kind of help to remember is to draw pictures, especially if you're more of a visual person. You can certainly create your list and memorize your lists. But if you pay attention to which way these fibers are kind of running when you draw your pictures and draw them that way, you can look at it and make educated guesses. So <clears throat> practice a few times. Your scapula. It's pretty much two triangles. So you draw a big triangle with a line coming up to bisect. Then you're going to go levator staff, rhomboids, trapezius is going to come up and in into the spine. So that's one, two, three, four of the muscles that we have. The next you can see from this side is the serratus anterior, which is these like finger like projections coming off from underneath. And if you pay attention to where those fibers are running, it's going to help you kind of hold on to what it does without having to memorize it terribly much. So, serratus anterior. Serratus anterior is inserting, and this is the one tricky part because it's hard to see, but it's actually inserting to the anterior portion of the medial border. So it goes all the way up underneath to grab here. And it's originating on the ribs, T2 through T9, T2 through T7, depending upon your sourcing. So it's coming off the. I broke it. Okay, serratus anterior, coming off the ribs and the front, reaching up underneath and grabbing that medial border. Protraction, hands down, one of the biggest pieces this thing does. So, you stick your arm out in front of you, and you shift it forward. You're basically just sliding that scapula anteriorly, you're protracting it. It's doing that. It's reaching up underneath and grabbing that medial board and sliding that whole thing forward. Now, a very unique piece about this, if you have an ACL tear, you see the VMO get inhibited. Neurogenically, it shuts it off. If you have a significant shoulder injury, this serratus anterior, you'll find is tremendously weak, weak end, inhibited. And you're not going to be able to get great rehab done on the glenohumeral joint if one of your scapula stabilizers isn't functioning well. Because there's this whole chain reaction of other things that start getting wonky in the process. One other piece that's helpful and indicative of strength, activation, weakness of serratus anterior is called scapular winging. If I look at this guy, and this is grabbing on this medial border, right up through here, then it's actually pulling that medial border 
in towards the thoracic cage. So if you have somebody do like a wall push-up, as they shift back, it's called scapular winging, to where that scapula elevates off of that thoracic cage, which is indicative of a serratus anterior that's not strong enough or activated enough. The more active that, that is, then the less winging you'll have. People that wing a lot, when we go through and have them go in this position, that scapula pops way off or allows you to get way underneath it because it's not doing its part to hold that medial border in. All right, last muscle. You go to the knees here in the front. We're going to hide pec major out of the way. We're going to see a little dude from three, four, and five on the ribs going up into the coracoid process called pec minor. So again, coracoid process, that finger like projection underneath on the top part of the scapula that reaches anteriorly, feel, find it, feel it by extending the shoulder as it tips it forward. Well, to extend, this muscle is grabbing it and pulling it, tipping it, pulling that top portion anteriorly. So it grabs it and leans it forward to where that inferior angle comes up off the body a little bit. Trapezius, rhomboid major, rhomboid minor, levator scap, serratus anterior, pec minor. Six muscles of scapular stabilization. Recognize that this coracoid process right here has got a lot of junk attached to it. We have coracoclavicular ligament, coracochromial ligament, so trapezoid point part of coracoclavicular, coracochromial, coracohumeral, so three major ligaments. Pec minor inserts into it. This is short head of biceps brachii. This is coracobrachialis. So you've got three muscles and at least three ligaments if you want to split coracoclavicular into conoid and trapezoid part, then you've got as many as seven things. Man, if that doesn't sound like a select all that apply on the test. Hint, it will be a select all that apply on the test. Okay, just make sure we caught that. Need to be too subtle. So it's just a major landmark that, that, that has a lot of significance for a lot of shoulder stability and mobility. Doing okay so far? Yep. I guess. All right, so let me walk you through a chain of, re chain of events real quick. Serratus anterior gets inhibited. It's not doing its job. What do we have a weakness in? Anybody here have a shoulder injury? Yep. Like still bother you? <laughs> yeah, come here. Guinea pig, get up here. All right, so what kind of motion is serratus anterior isn't working right over here to see? A, a, a problem with? So lie on your back. Release. Which shoulder? Right. Right on there. Okay, cool. So, um, this, this, you know, we're going first. So, protraction, right? So, protraction, <coughs> shoulder punches. Right? Punch up, hold it, don't want to push it down. She's squirming. All right, side to side. Shoulder punch up, don't want to push it down. Notice she doesn't kick her legs up fighting her so much. <laughs> slight inhibition, slight weakness, probably so. So, what happens if that's slightly weak? Roll over your stomach. All right, so we're going to take this arm, we're going to slide it up, look for some scapular winging. I can probably get underneath, terribly comfortable. If I go to the other side, have her tuck up. Actually, I can get into that one a lot easier. There's a reason for that. So if serratus anterior isn't working well, that medial border isn't being pulled in. So something else has to do that work. You would take a guess as to what has leverage to pick up the slack of serratus anterior and holding that medial border into the thoracic wall. There's never a great line of pull to do it, but it tries. Any 
guess. You get tied up here. Round voids, yeah. So you look at those round voids, they're grabbing this medial border, and if this can't pull it down and across, these are going to tighten pretty hard to hold it in. So if I try to get my hand under that scap, it's very difficult because these are so taut that I can't get underneath them. They're not relaxed. So what are their job? Is their job to hold that border in place? Not so much. Their job is actually to be able to fluidly move it back and forth. So if they're locked up trying to hold this, then where else do we have to, what muscle do we see get overloaded in trying to create that retraction? Traps. So we put the traps back on. So if the rhomboids are completely locked in this area, because serratus anterior isn't doing what it should, then my traps are going to be firing way too hard. So the place that we see, we see some secondary issues coming from shoulder problems gets to be in tension up in the upper traps. Because if I'm firing these really hard, and that means I'm going to start getting a lot of stress response in the upper neck. So right up and through there, a lot of tension in there? Yep. Yep, right there. So all of a sudden, this is indicative of tight rhomboids, which is indicative of a serratus anterior, which isn't firing, which probably comes from that shoulder injury. It's all the stabilization. So it's all that kind of connection. So if we inhibit one because of a shoulder injury, we're going to see a chain of events that's going to start throwing off, and it's called scapular dyskinesis. Kinesis is movement, dys is problematic, painful, dysfunctional. So scapular dyskinesis is that scapular thoracic articulation failing. And then I have you try to do things like, oh, I don't know, swim. Or I take baseball pitchers who have to go and throw 85, 95, 105 mile an hour fastballs, yet my scapula is not stable. And those problems aren't going to go away. So, with my case, because I know so Am my. Amputation. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, never my, have pain My acromion is shallow. Okay. So, like, would that also contribute because, like, there's a. I don't know. I mean, it. it Hood, but I think we're still looking more at like a dynamic stability of the scapula. Mm -hmm. I think if you actually went, even if you have that shallow acromion, that's going to cause more of an issue with potentially supraspinatus. It's going to subacromial arch a little bit, but it's not going to impact. It might impact your your AC joint some, mm -hmm. um, but I think that dynamic stability here should still be able to be. Reclaim. So exercises that actively seek to loosen and relax the rhomboids and definitely start working on activation of your serratus anterior. And you will feel this loosen up a whole lot more, which is going to give you more stability here because they can respond to the movements you put it through. What about so, the butterfly? What about the butterfly? Tight, they're always like this. Um, give me some of your butterflies. So they're always coming here to pull in and across. And they get those rounded shoulders yeah. that, 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 yeah. And they're really tight in through here. Or guys that go in the weight room and they only ever do pecs pulling in and bicep curls, so it's just anterior compartment, and they're rolled way in. I mean, yeah, it's going to cause a lot of stress and strain. So you're actually going to have a weakness within the rhomboids because they're probably pulled outside of their normal working range of motion. So they get weak and inhibited as they get more rotated and stretched. Yeah. So you need to work on them getting strengthened in a lot of retraction. And you'll find the other piece is that a lot of people miss the fact that these lower trap fibers, people talk to you about have good posture, put your shoulders up, and you're like pulling them back, like hold your scapula together, your shoulder blades together. Well, actually it's more pulling from the lower traps down that does all of that for you. So if you pull those lower traps down, try to focus on pulling that inferior angle, tucking it in rather than pulling back, it's actually a bit more comfortable in terms of less awkward. I mean, this, this feels really awkward. 
like I'm trying to pronounce my chest to the world. This is, feels more like it's just, it, it's a bit more neutral and natural. But activating this helps, again, fluidly control that rotation around the scapula. So how much of that do I need you to pound in your head? Well, be mindful of it. When you get into upper eval, keep that in mind as you go through it. When you get into rehab, add to it. So recognize your scapula stabilizers. But do, especially in this case, hold the connections of how one of those muscles is going to respond and act to the dynamic control that you get in the others. Is it? Close stuff?